Hello and welcome to this presentation on analyzing buckling that's caused by thermal expansion modeled in ANSYS Workbench Mechanical. We're going to look at both linear and nonlinear approaches. Here is a Workbench project page. We're going to look at three models. One will be a simple linear eigenvalue buckling problem. It's thermal expansion that will cause the buckling. The second is nonlinear buckling performed in a static structural analysis. We'll raise a temperature and observe that a structure starts to buckle. Finally, we'll have an eigenvalue buckling analysis, but we'll have a nonlinear setting in the static structural model that precedes the eigenvalue buckling analysis. Here is an analysis that starts with a linear structural analysis. The linear structural run will transfer stresses into an eigenvalue buckling analysis, and we find the modes of buckling. We can go to the analysis settings in the structural run and see that large deflection is off. If we check the material properties, we'd see that the material properties are also linear. We've put an X movement constraint at the left-hand side and one at the right-hand side to confine this body so that when it thermally expands, there will be compressive stresses in the X direction. We've prevented a vertex from moving in Z, and on two edges, one at the left and one at the right, we've prevented vertical movement. So we have a body here that cannot thermally expand in the X direction. It can thermally expand in Y and in Z, but because of these constraints, it's not free to translate and rotate globally. There's no pressure applied. We've suppressed it in this analysis, and we can quickly get a solution. Here's the state of stresses. It's constant stress. It's a stress in the X direction. Deformation is a growth in Z. It's not very big. You can see small numbers. Growth in Y is very small but it's not resisted. The only resistance to growth is in X, and we get a compressive stress acting in the X direction. If we take a look at vector principal stresses, and let me go to a wireframe view, you could see that they are compressive stresses running on X. We've put a force reaction measurement in at the left-hand side, and you can see that there's compression in the X direction and that's because of thermal expansion. If I go to the environment, you'll see an environment temperature of 70 degrees. Here we're in British units, Fahrenheit. And our thermal condition is a temperature of 100. So we have a 30 degree temperature increase. It's caused thermal expansion, and we get that thermal stress. If we go down to the eigenvalue buckling run, it refers to the structural environment. That's what's going to cause the state of stresses. Our analysis settings are asking for three modes. And if we go to the solution branch, you can see a load multiplier of 13.101 for the first mode. The first mode is buckling like this. The second mode is a more complex buckling shape. And the third mode is still more complex. It's usually the first mode of buckling that we're interested in. It's what you'd expect if the left and right hand sides were squeezed together and the body was not free to run away in three dimensions. It buckles up in the middle. To find the actual buckling temperature, we can bring up a calculator. Recall up above that we increased the temperature by 30 degrees above that environment temperature that was 70. Now, that's the only load on this model. There's that factor of 13.101. Back to the calculator. If we take the factor of 13.101 and multiply it by the 30 degree temperature change, you'll see 393. That's the temperature increase that would cause buckling. 
since we started with 70 degrees. If we add that, we see that the temperature that would cause buckling is 463 degrees and change. That's relative to an environment temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this should be the temperature that causes simple linear eigenvalue buckling. The next model we'll look at has large deflection turned on. This will be a nonlinear buckling analysis that does not include eigenvalue buckling. It's just a static structural run. We have the same boundary conditions and we're going to work from an environment temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and apply a temperature that's above the predicted eigenvalue buckling number. We're going to put in 500 degrees Fahrenheit. In the analysis settings we bring the load up through at least 50 substeps and as many as 500 to try to capture the details in the behavior. This time we've turned on a very small pressure value. It's only 5 psi. Its purpose is to put a very slight bow in this plate so that it has a direction in which to buckle. And that pressure causing a bowing is kept at just 5. It's not ramped up. It's a constant. It's so slight that it'll be easy to converge in the first substep. After that the temperature ramps up and eventually the thing will buckle. Let's go look at the resulting behavior. Here's the stress, and you can see that the stress rises. Let me turn off the minimum number. You can see that the stress rises more or less linearly as time ramps up, and then as the structure starts to buckle, the stress starts to rise more rapidly. There's our total deformation, again rising rapidly once we start to buckle. Directional deformation, of course, is about zero at the ends and peaks in the middle. And you can see it taking off as it starts to buckle. That's as gain as the temperature goes up. Another look at stresses. Here's a force reaction. Now the force on the end rises, and then once the buckling starts, it becomes almost flat. It doesn't take much of an increase in force to have the thing buckling, although here the force is caused by thermal expansion. Here's a chart, and what we're comparing in this chart is the reaction force and the temperature. Let's turn off some of the unnecessary details here. What we're looking at now in orange is a chart of the reaction force versus the temperature. You see on the x-axis that as the temperature hits up around 450, 460, this curve starts to flatten because we're buckling. And although it's not a sharp change in curvature, it is around the 450, 460 mark that you can see this start to flatten. And it would be where buckling is shown in a nonlinear static analysis. Here's a third model. In this model, we've turned on large deflection, so this is a nonlinear analysis. It has the same kinds of loads as the previous nonlinear run. Here, however, we're just bringing the temperature up to 100 degrees, and that does not cause buckling. It has the same kinds of boundary conditions, including the X direction constraints, the vertical constraint, and a constraint on a vertex preventing free sliding in the z-direction. Once again we get stress, we get deformation, very slight deformation because we have that very small pressure that puts this into an initial curve. We run this as a nonlinear analysis, ramping up through substeps, though nowhere near as many because we've not pushed it very far into nonlinear behavior and not enough to buckle. Now we have linked this nonlinear run to an eigenvalue buckling analysis. It's the same things as before. Here we've opted to see 10 modes. What we have to do in this buckling analysis linked to a nonlinear structural run 
is put in the kind of load that's taken further. In this case, it's a thermal load. Now notice that we've put in 200 Fahrenheit. That's 100 degrees more than the load we put in the static run. This perturbation, if you like, goes up another 100 degrees. And when we run the buckling analysis, we see that our first mode has a factor of 3.6934. Now what this is, this is a multiplier on the temperature difference, this 200 degrees versus the 100 degrees at the end of the structural nonlinear run. So we have a 100 degree increase. Multiply that by 3.6934. That gives us the increase required to cause buckling. Let's go look at the calculator. We had 100 degrees to start with, but let's do the multiplication first. So we've increased by 100 degrees. Multiply it by 3.6934 equals, and add to that the 100 degrees that we started with. And it tells us that 469.34 is the temperature that would cause buckling. It's very similar to what we saw with the linear buckling analysis. In cases that had more extreme nonlinearity here, we'd see a greater difference between the linear and nonlinear buckling solutions. So what you have to note here is that this buckling factor, the 3.6934, is multiplied by the temperature difference between the entry here and the entry up above in the static run. And then the buckling temperature is going to be the difference between the 100 degrees here and the 200. That's a 100 degree change. Multiply by the buckling factor, add it to the original temperature here, the 100, and you get a buckling temperature. And that's it.